Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Scientific Saturday lec lecture series. These lectures are our endeavor to take global science to the students residing even in the remotest corner of the nation. I am Rishabh Nakra, founder and admin of the Secrets of the Universe channel. Our guest for today is Professor Michael Dozer. He is a research physicist at CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland who has specialized in working with antimatter, using it either as a tool to study the strong interaction or as an object to, of, self, uh, of studies itself. He is currently focusing on the formation of antiatoms, the search for an explanation of the matter-antimatter asymmetry and the measurement of the gravitational interaction between matter and antimatter, and is the spokesperson of the AEGIS experiment at CERN. He is also involved in numerous outreach activities, both locally and internationally in Europe and Asia, speaking to a wide spectrum of non-specialist audiences from school children to decision makers, often also at art related events. Hi everyone, myself Vishaka, founder of Gurukul Academy. And before we invite Professor Michael Dorso for this lecture, I would like to remind everyone that we'll be taking questions after this presentation. So I would request all of you to post your interesting queries in the comment section, and we'll be taking it once the lecture is over. We welcome you, sir. Welcome to you as well. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. We are very fortunate, sir, and privileged to have you with us today. And without any further uh, delay, I request Professor to begin the session. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk about my favorite topic. Uh, I love talking about uh, antimatter and in particular the case of the missing antimatter. So I will give you an overview of what the status of the research is uh, in, in dealing with antimatter. But before we come to the, the hardcore science bits, I'd like to take a small detour, um, a detour via Hollywood, uh, because Hollywood, of course, has been interested in this topic as well. And if ever you have seen the movie Angels and Demons, which uh, features Tom Hanks as uh, a prominent uh, protagonist in the movie, you will see what I am talking about. Let's take a quick look at an extract from the movie Angels and Demons that is already a few years old, but takes place or starts out at certain. Positions of six and eight. LHC injecting protons, beam one. Particles at 99% the speed of light. Lighting stable beams. Inact injection kicker. We have a signal on the luminosity monitors. We have events. Photons are moving. Very impressive. Uh, so the synopsis of this story is rather complex. Uh, antimatter is stolen in large amounts from the Large Hadron Collider here at CERN and is brought to Vatican and hidden there. Uh, it's an extremely explosive bomb. I'll come back to that afterwards. And of course, the movie is built on the premise that there is a countdown until the destruction of the Vatican starts. Uh, there's a race against the clock to save it. And of course, antimatter plays a central role in all of this. So there's a bit of truth in the movie. Um, several of the thing, things you saw in this short extract are actually true. For example, antimatter exists. Uh, this is something I will talk about afterwards. It's produced at CERN. A few grams of it would be enough to destroy Rome. So the question is, what is antimatter? If you think about this very famous equation, E is equal to mc squared, in a little bit more in detail, 
it's really nothing else but an exchange rate. Uh, energy and mass and matter are the same thing um, with an exchange factor of the speed of light squared. What this means is that you can transform energy into matter and matter into energy. And you can do this, for example, in particle collisions, like in the extract in the movie, where you transform the kinetic energy of a particle that collides with another particle into new particles and antiparticles. Now, because particles and antiparticles are identical, they have the same properties, and because of conservation laws, particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter, are always produced in pairs. You can see that in these pictures where a photon transforms into an anti-electron and an electron, or here where an anti-electron and an electron are produced at the same time, and there's a particle released by this collision, or here on the right-hand side where you see anti-electrons and electrons. These pair production processes can also be run backwards in time. When a particle and its antiparticle, an electron and anti-electron meet, they can transform back into energy, they can annihilate. And so you can have a series of processes of pair production and pair annihilation, pair production and pair annihilation. And in all of these processes, particles and antiparticles are indistinguishable. They're sort of mirror images of each other, except for certain uh, numbers. The numbers change. The charge, for example, a positive uh, anti-electron and a negative electron. But other than the sign of that charge, everything is identical. Now, if you go back to the moment of the Big Bang, right after the Big Bang, where all the energy of the Big Bang was transformed into mass, then you expect that particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter, are produced in equal amounts. So you expect a universe that is 50-50 matter and antimatter. And in order to see whether this is the case, well, the only thing you can do is look backwards in time, look out in space, for example, by using a telescope to look back towards the Big Bang, by looking at the development of stars, of galaxies, the first moments of formation of the first stars, or perhaps even further back, as far back as one can go to look at the Big Bang. So if you see this picture, for example, you can ask yourself, is half of what you see, are half of these galaxies that you can see there, these thousands of galaxies in this tiny part of the, the sky, is half of that matter, half of that antimatter? If you go back all the way to the cosmic microwave background, is half of that antimatter, is half of that matter? How can you tell what is what just by looking? Well, the, this is the real heart of the question. How do you recognize antimatter? Now, I said before, particles and antiparticles have the same properties. This is due to the fact that in order to describe antiparticles, you actually need quantum field theory, which is symmetric. And there's a symmetry called charge, parity, and time invariance that also can be used to argue and to prove that particles and antiparticles must have the same properties. Charge, mass, lifetime, magnetic moment, and coupling to external fields, to external forces. But if particles and antiparticles have the same properties, then anything combining them will also have the same properties. So atoms and antiatoms must also have the same properties based on exactly the same symmetry argument. What this means is that the light emitted by antiatoms, the light emitted by anti-stars, is identical to that emitted by stars. There's no difference in the color of the light emitted by an antiatom and that emitted by an atom. So just by looking at things, I cannot tell whether they're made of matter or antimatter. The only way you can tell whether something is antimatter is actually by destroying it with matter. Particle and antiparticle are produced in pairs, but as I said before, they can also annihilate in pairs. And if they annihilate in pairs and transform back into energy, this energy can transform into photons. And these photons are unique. This is an image of our galaxy seen from uh, with a telescope. And if you now look at the different colors that you see and filter out everything except for this one particular color that corresponds to the annihilation of an electron with an anti-electron, and this color is in the extreme ultraviolet, it's actually a gamma ray with a 
energy, no longer possible to talk about color, of 511 keV. If I put that filter on this image, this is what I see. This can be done with a telescope, a space telescope that is in orbit around the Earth, the Integral Space Telescope, but it's sensitive to this one specific color, and it sees that there is a blob of antimatter formed or annihilating at the center of our galaxy. Incidentally, uh, we don't know what this is, where this is coming from. It's a tiny amount compared to the overall mass of the galaxy. It corresponds to about three stars worth of antimatter over the course of the last few billion years. Three stars worth as to be compared with 100 billion stars in the galaxy. So this is not a 50-50 uh, situation. It's a tiny, tiny amount of antimatter for which we don't yet have an explanation, but where different hypotheses are being looked into, trying to see which of those hypotheses is the most able to explain the signal that is seen here. Another way to look for antimatter is by putting a detector, a device that can see antiparticles that fly through it in space. This is the antimatter spectrometer, the alpha magnetic spectrometer, sitting on the International Space Station. And this is looking for antimatter, anti-electrons, anti-protons, anti-deutrons in cosmic rays that rain through it continuously and trying to see whether there is an excess of antiparticles at certain energies for certain characteristics. But the bottom line of all attempts to see antimatter in the universe is that if you look at the universe through a telescope that only sees matter, what you see is the picture on the left with billions of galaxies. If you had a telescope that could only see antimatter, the picture on the right is what you would see, an empty universe. In other words, we have a mystery. We have a mystery of where the antimatter that should have been there, that should make up equal amounts of the universe as matter, where that antimatter has gone. It was formed in equal amounts at the moment of the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, and we exist because there is no more antimatter. Because if there were antimatter around us, it will continuously annihilate with matter. And since we are made of matter, we would be incapable of existing. Now, the real question is, where did it disappear to and how could it have disappeared? And why does nature have a preference for matter over antimatter? So the way to explain this asymmetry, this imbalance, is to hypothesize a symmetry breaking, a breaking between these two possible states, between matter and antimatter, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And if you can see these pictures, you can see where the evil villain is hiding, it's matter. Because at the end, matter is the only thing that survived and antimatter has disappeared. A symmetric universe leads to equal amounts of matter and antimatter. An asymmetric universe with a little bit more matter than antimatter results in a completely asymmetric universe with only matter since all the matter or almost all the matter and all the antimatter have annihilated each other. And only a tiny little bit of matter is left over at the end. And this tiny little bit of leftovers is everything that we see in the universe. The galaxies, the stars, us. Now, in order to understand what's happening, we can treat this situation like a mystery. And like every good mystery, every good TV mystery, uh, what we actually want to do is a crime scene investigation. And this is sort of what we've been doing by looking out at the stars and the cosmic microwave background. It's a crime scene investigation looking after the fact at the hints that are around and that might help us explain how the crime happened. But you can also go back and try to reenact the crime scene. Go back to the moment of the Big Bang or shortly after it and try to see if you can reproduce what happened at that time and see if that gives you a hint as to what actually happened later on. And what we're doing at CERN is a reenacting of the crime. We're investigating antimatter at CERN. This is an aerial picture of the CERN campus. You can see the CERN campus here. This is a research center, a very large research center. You can see the airport of Geneva here, the lake of Geneva here, and you can see where antimatter is being produced. It's in a tiny little place here at CERN. It's not CERN's main activity. And the word here 
antimatière, is chosen, it's the French word for antimatter, is chosen because this part of CERN re resides in France. The border between France and Switzerland runs something like this here and around here. Switzerland is to the right, France is to the left. And the antimatter factory is sitting just on the other side of the French border that runs right through the middle of CERN, just about here. We have four suspects. It's a crime, we need suspects. All of these have been accused of breaking symmetries, and we want to find out who is the real suspect, who is the real criminal. So we can look into neutrino physics. This is the creation, the formation of leptons. This is the mechanism by which then the universe becomes asymmetric. We can look at mesons, where the mechanism, the, the tool of the crime, is a violation of the charge parity um, symmetry. Or we can go into more fundamental areas where we can also look at which particular process was responsible, a more fundamental symmetry, charge parity and time violation, or gravity. The interesting thing is that while CERN particle physics usually takes place at very high energies, these processes all take place at low energies. In fact, such low energies that we can talk about atomic physics. When we look for symmetry breaking, we can, we're really looking at whether something looks the same in the mirror. Uh, the yellow apple in a mirror should look like a yellow apple, but this mirror is a special mirror. It's a broken symmetry mirror so that the image is not yellow anymore, but blue. One of the areas where we know that there is symmetry breaking is in the mirror image of a spinning top, if this top is a neutrino. A neutrino, you can see the top here, is spinning to the left. It's a clock, a clock, counterclockwise spinning neutrino. If I put this neutrino into a mirror, or if I look at this neutrino in the mirror, then it will be rotating clockwise. This neutrino here exists. This mirror image of a neutrino does not exist in our universe. This complete breaking of the symmetry is called parity violation in the case of neutrinos. And we also know that for mesons, such as K mesons, B mesons, and D mesons, this combined symmetry of parity and charge is also violated. So there's a justification for looking further into the charge, parity, and time violation. This asymmetry, this difference between matter and antimatter could be in the fundamental properties of particles and antiparticles, or it could be in their coupling to forces, to the strong, the weak, the electromagnetic, or the gravitational interaction. And so we're looking at the microscopic level, trying to see whether there's difference between matter and antimatter. And as I said, we're talking about low energy experiments, experiments that work with atoms. So one of the simplest atoms, or the simplest atom that one can think of, is hydrogen. And hydrogen has certain emission spectrum. There are certain energy levels or colors of light that hydrogen can absorb or can emit. And if you shine light through hydrogen, you will see that these bands, the red, the blue, the purple, these very well-defined bands are bands where light is absorbed by hydrogen. And these are the same bands of color that hydrogen, if you can get it to emit light, will emit light at. So this is either the emission spectrum or the absorption spectrum. And the question is then, if I compare the hydrogen absorption and emission spectrum with that of antihydrogen, whether I will see a difference between the two. The reason why one looks at the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum is simply because light is something that can be measured extremely precisely. And so this is a very sensitive tool with which to work. The second system one can ask, it's a very simple experiment, drop an apple on the earth, it falls in a certain way, but what happens if I replace the apple with an anti-apple? Will it still fall in the same way? And will it fall the same way on an Earth and on an anti-Earth. These are theoretical questions and were theoretical questions until not so long ago, but in the last 10 years, we've been able to start answering them, doing experiments to actually look at the color of light emitted by antihydrogen, and we're on the verge of being able to drop anti-hydrogen. All this is taking place at the antimatter factory at CERN, 
the anti-proton decelerator. And in fact, it's the world's only antimatter factory. There is no other place on Earth where antiprotons are produced and then combined into atoms. This is the world totality of experiments working on antimatter atoms. There's only half a dozen of them. And they're looking at antimatter systems in different ways. I'll talk about one of these. Uh, you'll see which one I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, um, which deals with trapping antimatter. It's not easy to trap antimatter. It's, it's hard to, to make antimatter. It's much, much harder to trap it. And the reason for that is that when one makes antimatter, one makes it at high energies. This is why these experiments take place at CERN. The energy required to make antimatter is about a GeV, a billion electron volts, which corresponds to temperatures of around 100 billion degrees. Once antimatter is produced, antiprotons or positrons, anti-electrons, then it has to be slowed down first by an antiproton decelerator, then by an extremely low energy ring. Now we're down to energies corresponding to 100,000 volts, 100,000 electron volts, which is still a, a billion degrees. From there, we have to catch the antiprotons and the antielectrons, slow them down, cool them even more, so that at the end, they end up with energies that correspond to a temperature of about one degree above absolute zero. It's only when the particles, the antiprotons, the antielectrons, are at these very, very low temperatures that you can start forming atoms. These atoms can then be trapped if they're cold enough. So this is a tenth of a degree above absolute zero. And in order to test gravity, they have to be even colder, something like a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. Right now, we're about at this level here. This is as low as one can go for now. This is where we need to go for gravity. Trapping, as I said, has already been achieved. And this is the alpha experiment which has managed to trap antihydrogen atoms, to make them and to trap them, and to measure the color of the light that they emit. So in order to make antihydrogen, you have to bring in the components, the antiprotons and the positrons, into something called a penning trap. In this penning trap, one can control the position and the movement of charged particles. One can bring them together, and if any antihydrogen atoms are formed in the potential wells that are produced by these rings here, and these atoms are cold enough that they can be held by a magnetic field gradient, then they can be trapped. So this is something that was dis dis um, developed and uh, implemented by the Alpha experiment in 2010. The first atoms of antihydrogen were trapped then. Once they are in here, one can shine light at them. And when one shines light at these atoms, they can be kicked out of this well. They can escape, and once they escape and hit matter, they will annihilate, and it's this annihilation radiation that shows that they were there in the first place and that they were kicked out. So if you shine light at these trapped atoms and you change the color of the light, you can see that for certain colors of light, certain frequencies, these atoms come out more easily, and with that, you can measure the color of these lines here because you shine light of this particular color, as soon as you're a little bit off to the side, down here, the atoms don't come out. When you're exactly at the right color, the atoms do come out. And when you're a little bit off on the other side, again, the atoms don't come out. I said a little bit to the side. In fact, this curve is so narrow that you would not be able to see it on this picture here. Antihydrogen and hydrogen have the same color they absorb and emit light of the same color to one part in 10 to the 12. This is an extremely precise experiment, and it's being improved as we speak in the coming years. The second type of experiment they can do, not just measure the properties of antihydrogen, the intrinsic properties of antimatter, is to try to drop antimatter. And in order to do that, you either need an ultra-cold trapped atom, like this gentleman here on the Tower of Pisa, who had two spheres of different composition, held them and then dropped them. This is one possibility. The other possibility is to shoot them out of a cannon, like this cannonball, and to follow their parabolic trajectory. This is what my experiment does. We're trying to build a cannon, and we're trying to shoot cannonballs 
out of this cannon. Our cannon looks like this. There's a lot of equipment around here to make the experiment work, but at the heart of it is this tiny little cannon in here. You can recognize the rings that I drew before. Inside here are antiprotons. Here you can just barely see two prisms, which will change, uh, which will transport laser light, which will change positronium atoms, so atoms made of an electron and a positron that are produced inside this little target that we built ourselves. These positronium atoms fly into the antiprotons and form antihydrogen. This is a pulsed process and one that we managed to get to work at the end of 2018, so only a few years ago. The next step is then taking these atoms and pushing them out down here and then watching them fall. So what this looks like is simply a cannon with a cannonball. And if the cannonball is moving very fast, it will move straight. But if it's not moving very fast, if it's moving sort of slowly, you'll see what happens in a second. These cannonballs move straight. We create some structure that masks them off. These are like shadow masks, gratings, that will select certain atoms that can fly out. And because of the parabolic trajectory that the atoms follow um, due to gravity, these atoms, instead of flying straight, will fall down a little bit by about 10 micron, a hundredth of a millimeter, and where they touch this device, they will annihilate. Many atoms are needed to produce many of these annihilation points, and for each one of these annihilation points, you can see where it is, and in this case, for example, you will see that all the annihilation points are shifted slightly downwards with respect to where a straight line would end up. Once they hit that device, one can measure where they annihilate. And this is actually done via photographic plates. Photographic plates to see particles was a technology in developed and used originally to investigate cosmic rays, just like the alpha magnetic spectrometer does now with other devices by Marietta Blau in 1933, so not quite 100 years ago. And this is in fact the first picture of an antiproton coming in to a photographic emulsion plate and annihilating. Where it stops, it annihilates on a nucleus of, for example, silver or bromine, and then this nucleus bursts into pieces. And what you see here are the fragments of this nucleus that has been burst apart by an antiproton. This is, in fact, the first picture of an antiproton having been produced inside an accelerator in uh, the United States in 1956. In the meantime, we have somewhat slight, slightly better photographic emulsions. Here's a picture from our own experiment where you can see half a dozen annihilation points of antiprotons entering the emulsion, annihilating, and then producing annihilation stars like this one here. And you can already see, this is in a view through a microscope, that there is depth information. So we take this depth information and we use it to be able to see where exactly the annihilation takes place, at what depth and at which position, so that we can really reconstruct with about one micron precision, so a thousandth of a millimeter precision, where the annihilation of the antihydrogen atom took place. You can do this by scanning through, you can also then use this scan and create a 3D image of the annihilation of the antiproton inside the photographic plate. And what you could see from this 3D image is that the antiproton comes in from the left, annihilates almost at the surface, and then the fragments go in all directions. And again, we can use this to discover how deep the, where exactly the annihilation took place and how deep or how, how far the antihydrogen atom fell on its flight uh, on the parabolic trajectory. This is state of the art. This is actually what is happening these days, these weeks. We will start working again with antiprotons after a two year hiatus of refurbishing of the accelerators at CERN, but also of our experiments so that we are able to do more precise measurements. And the first measurements of gravity should happen in the next two years. We expect, of course, that gravity will be the same as for matter, but it's actually only once you've done the experiment that you will be absolutely certain. And there is always room for 
an unexpected surprise because while we are convinced that we understand the physics behind all of this, we can't be certain until we've checked. Now, of course, these fundamental physics questions are very important for us. We're driven by that, but we're also aware that many of the technologies that we develop are of use for society. And some of these have actually already been implemented. I'd like to talk about some of the applications of antimatter and focus on the most obvious ones. The first one is positron emission tomography, also known as PET scans. The second one is radiotherapy. Then I'll talk a little bit about energy production, and then I'll say a few words about other ideas. So let's start with positron emission tomography. Positron emission tomography relies on anti-electrons annihilating with electrons inside the body. It's obtained, or it's possible to obtain anti-electrons by injecting molecules, sugars in particular, that contain a radio isotope that emits positron when it decays. So if the body takes up this molecule or sugar, it will be a cell with a high metabolic rate that needs energy, that molecule will enter the cell, stay in the cell, and where it decays will be inside that cell so that the positron is emitted inside the cell that you're interested in seeing and it annihilates in there. Two photons are produced when, it when the positron annihilates with an electron and these photons can be detected outside of the body. This is what a scanner looks like. The patient is lying in here. This area here contains detectors which register the photons that come from the annihilation of an anti-electron with an electron and by recording the position of the impact of the photons, one can reconstruct where these come from. These detectors were originally developed in physics labs for other purposes, but of course now are used for medical imaging. This molecule, the sugar that I talked about, is this kind of molecule here. And the radioisotope that I'm thinking of, that I mentioned, is fluorine in this particular molecule. But you can use other radioisotopes such as carbon-11 or nitrogen-13, oxygen-15. All of these can be used for molecules with a physiological fun function. So this can be sugar, the glucose, but it can also be an enzyme or a signal transmitter, dopamine. All of these molecules will be injected in the patients, they travel through the body, and then they are taken up by cells that are sensitive to this particular molecule. The annihilation of this positron that is produced in the decay of the radioisotope inside the molecule produces two photons that go out back to back. So if I measure this point here and this point here, I have a straight line that goes through this area here. I need to make sure that I have a coincidence between these two crystals to know that the two photons happened at the same time. But once I have that, I know that somewhere along this line is an area that has emitted anti-electrons. And if I wait a little bit, then maybe another molecule in the same cell or in the same area will also emit two photons. But that does not mean that they go in the same direction. Since these are random processes, those two photons will end up in different crystals. And so I get another straight line here. The intersection of these two straight lines tells you that this is where things came from. And this is enough if you have a single source. If you have multiple sources, like here, you have to be sure that these two photons came from the same part of the body as these two. These two photons don't come from the same one as from these two. So it's a more complex reconstruction uh, problem, but it's a reconstruction problem that can be solved. And so you can end up with a perfect map of the body in 3D where you can see all the areas, for example, where uh, positron emission tomography has shown metabular activity. Metabolic activity is usually inside the brain. You can see the brain at the top of this body here, very active, uh, high need in glucose. You can also see the heart, the kidney. You can also see the bladder, which is where much of the radioisotopes, many of the molecules end up. But you can also see in the middle, in this red area, a few areas that should not be active. And these few areas are actually, in this particular case, um, cancer cells, cancer tumor regions that um, are growing rapidly and to grow rapidly need lots of energy. So this is a way to detect 
uh, tumors at an early stage already. I mentioned you can also use it for other things. And in fact, this is a way to look for serotonin, for dopamine, for amyloid binding molecules, if you're interested in understanding the origins of Alzheimer's opioid receptors if you're interested in understanding the reward system of the brain. It's important for pharmacological in, uh, investigations. It's important to see if you can tell the difference, at least neurologically speaking, between the brain of a man and a woman. And I challenge you to see any difference between these two brains in terms of serotonin uh, uptake cells. They are absolutely identical. Men and women are indistinguishable in the, the way they uh, react to serotonin. But it can also allow you to try to understand processes that happen inside the brain. Uh, for example, language-related processes. Different parts of the brain are active for different activities related to words. Whether you hear words, whether you see words, whether you speak words, or whether you think about words, all these involve different parts of the brain. And understanding how these work with each other and how they interact helps you understand some diseases of the brain and some, uh, some, some behavioral uh, problems that people might develop uh, as a consequence of, for example, a stroke. Now, of course, you want to combine this information with other channels of information uh, to get an even better picture of what's happening inside the brain. And so you can combine positron emission tomography images, which tell you something about where the brain is active, with nuclear magnetic resonance images, which tell you where the structures of the brain are. And if you combine those two, you get a much richer image of what is actually happening and which parts of the brain, which local parts of the brain are involved in certain processes. So this is good for diagnostics, but once you have diagnosed, for example, a tumor, you want to treat it. And right now, treating tumors with radiation has more or less two options. You can either treat it with x-rays or you can treat it with protons. So what you see here is a cross section through a head where x-rays are injected from the left inside the brain. And what you realize immediately is that in these areas here, in the red areas, is where most of the x-rays deposit energy. In fact, the ma majority of energy is deposited here a little bit here and almost nothing back here. But there is still even behind the area that you want to irradiate, which is this area here, a significant amount of radiation. If you do the same thing with protons, you can see that protons behave very differently. They don't deposit all this energy here at the entrance. They actually deposit very little energy at the entrance. They deposit quite a bit more energy in this region here. And then downstream of there, this area, there's almost there is no energy deposit at all. Protons and x-rays behave very differently. And if your goal is to treat a tumor in this area here, you definitely do not want to damage this part of the brain. And you don't want to damage this part of the brain here either. Proton therapy is much, much better than x-ray therapy for deep tumors. Now, we wanted to ask a question to see if we could do something better than proton therapy, which is to ask a whether antiprotons could be even more efficient than protons. This is justified from a physics point of view because antiprotons and protons, when they enter the body, are moving at high speeds, so they should not annihilate easily. They should reach about the same depth inside the body, but then when they stop for the protons, that's the end of the story. For the antiprotons, on the other hand, this is when life gets interesting because that is where they can annihilate and so release more energy. And if you tune the energy, the penetration depth of antiprotons just right, just like protons, you should be able to deposit even more energy at the point that they stop at, which is where you would aim uh, in case you're trying to treat tumors. So in order to test this idea, a small experiment was done. This is a representation of a human as seen by a physicist. So it's an aquarium. We're basically just water. And inside this aquarium is a test tube. You can see it here in white. Inside this test tube are living hamster cells that are suspended inside gelatin so that they cannot move around. This is where the antiprotons come out of the accelerator. They enter the test tube and they have enough energy to reach about this depth here. So once the antiprotons have irradiated these cells, the cells are extracted and then checked for survival. 
whether they are damaged, whether they are uh, able to still reproduce, whether they can still multiply, or whether they're dead. So what is shown here is how much energy, how much dosage is deposited inside the cells as a function of the depth. So this is about 15 centimeters inside water. This is about how deep you want to shoot with protons normally. And as I mentioned before, gamma rays deposit most of their energy upstream as they enter the body and only a little bit of energy where you want it to be deposited and quite a lot of energy still downstream of where you want it to be deposited. Protons, this is in red, deposit all their energy more or less where you want it in here. You can also shoot carbon ions inside the body. That's the yellow line. It's a very narrow line here, but there's still some uh, tail back here. And in green is what you get for antiprotons. And what you see here is that antiprotons compared to protons deposit less energy on the healthy tissue upstream of the tumor. They deposit a tiny amount of energy downstream of the tumor and they deposit a very narrow spike in here, almost as narrow as carbon ions inside the tissue. This is wonderful, uh, but these are first results. These are results obtained with antiprotons on living hamster cells, healthy living hamster cells in a test tube. So one has to see whether this also works with tumor cells, with human tumor cells, and with human tumor cells inside humans. But more importantly, it's much too expensive. It's far more expensive than treating people with protons, and it's also much more expensive than treating people with carbon ions. In fact, carbon ions might not even be the best alternative therapy. There are a number of accelerators that are looking into other ions, uh, lighter ions, that could have a behavior that is even better than carbon ions, almost as good as that of antiprotons, but at a much lower price. So although further research is certainly warranted in this area, it's not clear that antiprotons can be used for radiotherapy. But what about antimatter as fuel for spaceship? Certainly, if you annihilate an antiproton with a proton, this is a maximal efficiency because all the matter is being transformed into energy. Whereas for a nuclear reaction, it's something like a per mil, and for chemical reaction, it's something like a millionth of the mass that is transformed into energy. So, relative to the weight of the fuel, antimatter is the best fuel that you can think of. And in fact, antimatter can be produced. You don't need an accelerator for that. Uh, you are producing antimatter right now. Uh, about 180 positrons are produced per hour in a person weighing 80 kilograms. It depends a little bit on what they've been eating because most of this comes from the decay of potassium 40. It's a natural isotope that is taken up by your body when you drink water or when you eat and even when you breathe. And in fact, a, a banana is a good source of potassium 40. So if you eat many bananas, you have lots of potassium 40. And so you have many more positrons than somebody who doesn't eat bananas at all. A banana produces about one positron per hour. That's sort of a canonical number. And this is a very good source of positrons, but it's not a very efficient source of positrons. To actually get one gram of antimatter, via the E is equal to mc squared equation means that uh, if you annihilate a quarter of a gram of matter with a four quarter of a gram of antimatter, that's sort of equivalent to 10 kilotons of TNT. Now, the production rate of antimatter at CERN is something like 10 million antiprotons per second, which means something like 10 to the 14 antiprotons per year, which is a huge number. It's lots of antiprotons, but um, one gram corresponds with Avogadro's number to six times 10 to the 23 particles, which means that it will take about 1 billion years to produce one gram of antimatter. 10 billion years is about the time since the Big Bang. So if CERN had been running uninterruptedly since the beginning of the universe, we would now have one gram of antimatter. At a cost that is quite high, uh, this would cost somewhere around 25 million billion euros. And the production rate at CERN, if you look at it the other way around, is about 10 nanograms per year, which corresponds to about 250 watt hours, which is 
not really useful. And if you want to use bananas, you need something like 10 to the 20 bananas to produce 2,000 watts. Not very efficient. In fact, this tells you a little bit about how much antimatter is worth or how much it costs. Gold, the price of gold is about $50,000 per kilogram right now, give or take 10,000. But antimatter is about $50,000 per gigabecquerel. A gigabecquerel is a unit for the decay rate, which corresponds to a billion decays per second. So a one gigabecquerel source of sodium-22, which is what we use for our experiments, produces about 10 to the 17 positrons over the course of its lifetime. And that, because positrons are so light, corresponds to 10 to the minus 10 grams. In other words, antimatter is about 10 to the 13 times more valuable than gold. If you thought gold is expensive, antimatter is far more expensive than that. And that naturally led to the idea, among an artist, that while it's good to have a bank based on gold, it's a lot better to have a bank based on antimatter. And this first bank of antimatter was founded by uh, the artist Jonathan Keats. And uh, you can deposit antimatter. You have to be very careful that your antimatter doesn't touch anything, though, because if it does, it will annihilate and your money will have evaporated. And with that, I've come to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I mean, I was obviously glued to the lecture again, and uh, I have so much to say. But uh, first of all, I would uh, start with uh, thanking you, thanking you for such an interesting and insightful talk. And uh, most of us probably think that the universe is made up mostly of matter and not its uh, and not antimatter. And scientists have been definitely grappling with this question that. Why antimatter? Why matter dominates our uh, universe? So hopefully we find the answer soon. And I was particularly amazed by the three D image of the anti uh, proton nucleus annihilation. Yes, it's a so beautiful that, image. Yes, yes. And so I would also like to thank you for taking us through the applications of this research on the lives of a common man. Indeed, this research on antimatter in laboratory to the, in laboratory today is, is uh, helping us to study the human body in such mm -hmm. detail. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> we are in debt to particle physics for this amazing work. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. I'm I'm glad you found it interesting. <laughs> yes, it was indeed. So, sir, with this, we'll be taking our very first question. Uh, our very first question is coming from Hakim. Uh, he says that how do we know that at the beginning of the universe, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter? So to some extent, it's a hypothesis, and I want to be completely honest about this. Uh, it's possible to create models of the, uh, the formation of the universe where you have an asymmetry built in from the beginning. Now, we see a symmetry every time we condense energy in the lab, complete symmetry pair production of matter and antimatter. This, if you hypothesize that the universe started out asymmetrically, you have to explain then where that asymmetry came from. It, it, it sort of pushes the problem under the rug to say that the universe was asymmetric from the beginning, but that doesn't mean that there are not um, cosmologies that do postulate an asymmetry from the beginning, and, and not the worst theorist, Neil Turok, for example, postulates a completely symmetric universe where the asymmetry is simply the timeline, where the matter rushes forward in time, the antimatter rushes backward in time. This is a way to bring in an asymmetry into the process itself from the start. But the problem is that that hypothesis is not testable. So in a way, what you're asking is how science works. Right now, we have a model, we have an idea, uh, we have a model for the cosmology. We have a model or an observation inside the lab that says the universe is symmetric. And we're trying to explain how an asymmetry can develop inside that model. We're doing this by different ways that I explained in this lecture. And until we have excluded those possibilities, we're going to stick to that, keeping open the possibility that that model is wrong, but not quite yet. We're still, there's still a bit of hope that we can find the cause of this asymmetry. If we find the cause, then we don't need to, postulate an asymmetric model. 
Um, and and the, re the, the thinking behind all of that is that scientists like to be able to falsify their models. They like to be able to have a model that can be falsified. And if you have a model that postulates an asymmetry from the beginning, you cannot falsify it. It's not verifiable. It's not testable. And that's not something that scientists like to like to deal with. They prefer to have models that they can test and shoot down, possibly, but at least that they are in principle testable. So, if we are able to, uh, if we are to, uh, you know, believe this hypothesis, uh, I think, and design a time time travel machine, we are, we might be able to find uh, the missing antimatter. <laughs> because you it might, moves backwards. <laughs> you might go back to the beginning of the universe, but you'll find it a rather unpleasant place. It's extremely hot, <laughs> extremely dense, extremely okay. violent. Um, not a place you want to go and, and visit. Sure. Thank you so much for the answer, sir. Thank you. So the next question is by Sergio. He's asking, uh, could the antimatter change during the Big Bang to become the subtle dark matter and energy? Like, yeah. Is missing antimatter somehow related to dark matter? So the short answer is no. Uh, dark matter and antimatter are two completely separate things. And in fact, dark matter should also exist in the form of dark antimatter. The, we don't actually know what dark matter is. Uh, there are many different hypotheses, different, many different models for the, the nature of dark matter. Many of these assume that dark matter is some form of particle and that those particles then have their antiparticles. But that's not certain. And we don't have any idea about what the mass of this particle is or this antiparticle, this dark matter particle. I said not, so that's, that's sort of the short answer. Antimatter and matter are one thing. So everything you see, every particle that you have around here has its antiparticle um, equivalent, an antiproton, antineutrons, antielectrons, and they are visible. They're, they produce light because they can interact with electromagnetic uh, ra uh, radiation. Dark particles and dark antiparticles can. That's why they're dark. They don't emit light. They don't absorb light. Uh, they only interact gravitationally, that we know, and perhaps with a weak interaction. That we don't know, it's an assumption, because if they don't, then they will be very hard to detect. But there are some models of dark matter that actually make dark matter consist of normal matter, but that is in such a form that it cannot interact with light. It's neutral. And there are some ideas, I'm writing a paper on this right now, so I won't tell you too much about it, about how to use antimatter to produce these dark matter particles. And uh, so that would be a link between dark matter and antimatter. Wow. <laughs> We're <laughs> finally getting some answers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so the, another question, the next question is coming from Watson. Uh, he says that today we see all the objects around us is made up of matter. This means that it is more stable than the antimatter. If this is so, then why do we observe traces of antimatters, uh, antimatters in the universe? Okay, so first of all, antimatter and matter should be equally stable. Uh, a, a particle and an antiparticle have the same properties. And we this is one of the things that we're testing. Uh, I talked about the color of light emitted by antihydrogen or the mass or the charge of an antiproton. These are the experiments that are being done here. But you can also measure the lifetime of a particle and of an antiparticle. And you can see if you could find a difference between th those at that level. Now. Most particles have very short lifetimes, um, a millionth of a second, a billionth of a second, and those you can test easily. For stable particles and antiparticles like protons or electrons, it's more difficult because you need to watch a huge number of them and to see if some of them disappear while you're watching. Since we don't make many antiparticles, you can't watch huge numbers of antiparticles. And any antiparticle that comes in contact with matter will it also disappear, but because it's annihilated, not because it's decayed. So with all these caveats, I can say that antiprotons live at least 10 years. That's how long they've been held here at CERN by one of the experiments in the best possible vacuum that you can think of or longer. They might live as long as protons. In fact, they should live equally long as protons, but that hasn't been experimentally measurable up to now. Protons, we know, live up to 10 to the 32 years or longer if they even decay. And getting to that kind of limit with antiprotons is never going to be possible. 
We, we just don't have hundreds of tons of antimatter sitting around that we can watch. But the lifetime is the same for particles and antiparticles. Of that, we're absolutely sure within the areas that we've been able to measure it. Now, of course, maybe antiprotons only live a million years and not 10 to the 32 years. That will be very, very hard to measure. We wouldn't be sensitive with our detectors right now. And so if you can come up with a theory that explains why they would live so, so long, but not longer, then that would be a, a, a possibility. On the other hand, we do know from looking at the cosmic microwave background and from looking at the composition of the universe right at the beginning, so helium, lithium, and the different isotopes of helium, beryllium, that antimatter could not have been around for more than a few seconds after the Big Bang. After that, it would have changed many things. It would have changed the composition, the, the helium-3 to helium-4 to lithium uh, in the universe. It would have changed uh, nuclear baryogenesis, nucleus, nuclear synthesis, sorry, is the word I'm looking for. It would have changed the composition of the universe. It would also have changed the um, cosmic microwave background distribution. You would see it in the way that the, the, the structures inside the cosmic microwave background uh, can be extracted from what one observes. So th there's a limit to how long it can live, a few seconds at most. And so already there, there's an incompatibility with antiprotons living a million years and what the, the universe tells us. So we have to come up with something that's only a few seconds and that's excluded by our experiments. So I don't think the lifetime will be different between particles and antiparticles. A long-winded answer, I'm afraid, for, for a very good question. Yes, it's it's uh, it, we were able to understand this. So thank you so much. So the next question is by Marina Repin. Uh, we are spending billions of dollars in antimatter research, which in turn helps in various sectors on Earth. How important is it to ensure that this research is communicated to the common man? So first, let me let me correct a, a misperception. We're not spending billions of dollars. We're spending millions of dollars. My experiment costs about a million dollars. Uh, the other six a bit more, but we're not talking huge amounts. We're talking basically the price of a house in Switzerland um, per experiment, which is a lot of money, certainly, but it's not a lot of absolute terms. Uh, it's important to inform people about this, of course, and we're trying to communicate what we're doing through platforms like this one, but also through many other channels that we pursue. On one hand, to show how this research can be useful for people, for people's lives, for medical applications, but also for other applications, um, like good, um, how can I put this? Um, technologies that allow you to do better medical imaging, that also allow you to do better imaging in other areas. It allows you to study materials. Uh, we can study material uh, frailty. The, the aging of materials through anti-electrons. We can study pores, nanopores inside materials, which tell you something about structural integrity or possible structural damage in the future. These are kinds of things that are very useful applications. They're not our main goal, but we always keep them at the back of our minds and we use them when we can um, find an application. So we have to tell people about those applications. But I think it's also important to tell people about the universe, the, the, what we're learning about the universe by studying antimatter. And in a way, I think this is something that um, goes beyond the simple utilitarian argument of doing fundamental research. It's not because we find an application that we're doing the fundamental research, it's because we're curious about how the universe ticks. What is the universe made of? How does it interact? What is our place inside the universe? The fact that we can understand what's going on in the universe is what mm -hmm. motivates us to study the universe and to study its its uh, behaviors and its composition and in a way i don't believe we're alone in this i think everybody who's watching this show is curious about the world in which they're living and so we're doing it not just because you can look inside your body but also because it tells you a little bit about what this environment is in which you are living and it satisfies your philosophical curiosity absolutely <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for this. Uh, the next question is from uh, Kanha Sahu. And I'm, uh, you know, I have goosebumps why so I, I asked this question. <laughs> How do we store antimatter? Uh, <laughs> can we make an environment in which we can touch antimatter and do other things like normal matter? I mean, uh, I'm sure that the moment we touch, there's a, you know, 
there's a, a exactly. Balance. So the answer to the first question is very carefully. Um, you have to avoid that antimatter touches matter. And if you think of a single particle, a, a proton or an electron, it has a charge. So if you use an electric field, you put a charged particle next to an electric field, the particle will not be able to go into this electric field if it's moving slowly. You put two electric fields like this, the particle will bounce back and forth like this, but it can go out on the side. If you put a magnetic field on top of this, then the particle will move in a circle like this. This is what those rings that I showed you in the picture do. They basically create an electric field, a valley, inside a magnet, and so the particles just move back and forth like this. This is how we store antimatter, charged antimatter. That's easy. That's something that's been done for over 60 years now. Where life gets difficult is when you're trying to hold neutral antimatter, like atoms of anti-hydrogen. And for that, you need to know that an anti-hydrogen atom has a small spin on the anti-electron and a small spin on the anti-proton. Now, in a normal environment, the energy states of an atom are all the same. But if I put an atom inside a magnetic field, these energy levels will open up. And in fact, if I draw with my fingers now, the energy level for the four states corresponding to the four spin orientations inside a magnetic field that gets stronger and stronger, then these two states here actually gain energy as they go into the stronger field. They gain potential energy. And if they gain potential energy, that has to come from their kinetic energy. And so I can actually trap atoms if they have only enough energy to get this far before coming back down again. Very cold atoms can be trapped inside a magnetic um, bottle, inside a, 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 an area where the magnetic field has a minimum in the center and grows in all directions. And that's what the alpha experiment is doing. They have a magnetic bottle inside which they have their traps for the charged particles. And so any atoms that are formed inside this, these traps are also trapped inside the bottle if they're cold enough. They trap about 30 atoms out of a million that they make. So it's not a very good trap, but it's a good enough trap. So, so let me understand if, I mean, let me see if I understand this. And I'm a little curious that these field that is being created, that, that is not interacting with the magnet because the ma magnet is made up of matter, right? Exactly. So you have everything in vacuum. You have okay. a, a vacuum pipe in the center, very, very good vacuum, outside of which you have these electric fields and the magnetic fields. And the antiprotons and the antihydrogen atoms are moving in the vacuum and they're feeling the fields from outside. So they never touch any matter. They're only pushed along with electric fields, magnetic fields, and magnetic field gradients. This is some kind of magic. <laughs> well, it's not any different than putting two magnets together. If you push two magnets together, they want to go like this. You feel yes. the force. And in this case, imagine one of these is your antiparticle. It'll feel the force. So it's no different from the little magnets that you use on the refrigerator, except these magnets are a little bit more powerful. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question is something that I wanted to ask. So if we have to explain the CPT theorem to a layman, can we frame it as a universe in which you replace all the matter with antimatter, take its mirror image, and then reverse the direction of time? then that universe will be identical to ours. Yes, that's exactly it, yes. Uh, so you change the charge, you flip the charge, you flip the, the, any rotational elements in the mirror, and you inverse time. And then you end up with exactly the same behavior as the existing universe. So it's not you get that you get the same universe, you get a universe that obeys the same laws of physics. I think this is important to distinguish because what a symmetry theorem says is simply that the laws of physics are invariant under these symmetry operations. And so when I say a mirror symmetry, a mirror, like a real mirror, uh, when I talk about that mirror symmetry, what I'm actually saying is, imagine a ball that I drop here and it bounces here, and I have a description of its equation of motion here, and I look at what's happening in the mirror and I come up with an equation of motion of the ball in the mirror, those two equations are the same. The equations of motion, the description of what's happening is the same, the behavior is the same, but it's not identical. It's not the same thing. 
the ball in the mirror is not a real ball. It's just a mirrored ball. So it's not the same universe. But the laws of physics are the same. Uh, so uh, where does gravity add over here? Because if we make these transformations, how does it affect the uh, gravitational force? So gravity is invariant under CPT. In other words, what I expect is that an anti-apple on an anti-Earth will fall exactly the same way as an apple on Earth. But the experiment we're trying to do is a different one. We're trying to drop an anti-apple on Earth. And there, CPT doesn't tell me anything. The symmetry operation doesn't tell me what's going to happen. We have to use other, other arguments than, than the CPT symmetry to explain why you expect the same behavior of an anti-apple on Earth as for an apple on Earth. OK, so and do you think that this CPT symmetry might be uh, breaking at some level? Because uh, so far, we haven't seen any uh, anything that breaks the CPT symmetry in nature? Any experiment? Or is the answer, it there? The answer of a, of a particle physicist depends on whether you're talking to an experimental physicist or a theoretical physicist. A theoretical physicist will be convinced that CPT is not broken and cannot be broken because you can derive it based on very fundamental assumptions. But these fundamental assumptions for an experimental physicist are, again, assumptions. And so you have to test them. And there are loopholes. There are ways to break this symmetry. In fact, there's a model called the standard model extension, which is actually invented by a theorist, uh, Alan Kostoletsky in Illinois, which allows, even within everything we know, for CPT symmetry breaking. And so now the experimental physicist comes back in and says, well, if it's not explicitly forbidden, maybe it is there and we have to look. And even if it were explicitly forbidden, we should still look, just to be sure. Okay. Right. But I'm not going to bet my life on CPT symmetry being broken, <laughs> for sure. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, sir, for that. So the next question we have from Dashrath. Uh, the question is, can we have a particle accelerator in space? If yes, what are its benefits? There's one huge benefit from running these things in space, and that's that all the particle accelerators require vacuum. If, if you have bad vacuum, then any particle you accelerate will collide with rest gas, with some gas, atoms or molecules, and that will deviate its trajectory or even lose energy, and so you cannot run the accelerator. So we have to have very good vacuum inside all the accelerators here. A very good vacuum means better than the vacuum between the Earth and the Moon. That's a pretty lousy vacuum at our scale. So let's go outside of the solar system. Let's, let's go into intergalactic space where the vacuum really is very good. There, you would definitely be able to build an excellent accelerator. The problem is you need to bring your magnets there or build them there, which is going to cost a whole lot of money. So it's a lot cheaper to build better pumps and build it here on Earth than to put it into space. But if you want to build a really, really big accelerator, assuming you had infinite, well, very large num amount of, of money, you might think of building one on the moon. That's something that would allow you to adjust things um, at the level where things could work. You could build a very big accelerator, but it's, it's probably not useful. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to do things here on Earth. So I was particularly, you know, when you talked about that in the intergalactic and all, I was, uh, you know, imagining the kind of, uh, you know, distance that we need to travel for that. Yes. <laughs> so, but you also need time, of course, not just money. Yes. And the lousy distance between the uh, moon and the earth was something which, you know, kept my attention on. What is the lou lousy distance between the... the lousy uh, vacuum. The lousy, lousy vacuum. vacuum. I'm so sorry. Lousy uh, vacuum. Uh, well, the vacuum we're talking about here at, at CERN uh, that we achieve is about 10 to the minus 17 millibar. If you use a normal pump, just a scroll pump, you get around 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. Then a turbo pump goes down to 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, maybe 10 to the minus 9. Then if you use ion pumps, you get down to 10 to the minus 10. That's really good. 10 to the minus 10 millibar is an extraordinarily good vacuum. You have to work very hard and very cleanly to get there. Going from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 17, the only way you can do that is by cooling everything down to cryogenic temperatures, uh, basically a Kelvin, so that any atom that is still flying around, as soon as it hits a wall, will stick to the wall and not come off it anymore. 
And the longer you run this, the better it works because all the atoms that are still flying around will have stuck to the surface. That's not possible in space because there's constantly atoms coming through, there's constantly new gas coming out, and it's not that cold. Uh, contrary, I mean, it is cold, but it's not that cold. It's three degrees, 2.73 degrees above absolute zero, but that's not cold enough to stick helium yet. So you need to go even colder. And helium is, in fact, the worst contaminant that we have. And at one Kelvin, it starts sticking. Okay, sure. Thank right. you so much, sir. Thank you. So we have the last question by Kirti. She is asking that the basic difference between a, mat a matter particle and an antimatter particle is its electric charge. So what about the neutral particles? Do neutral particles also have antimatter counterparts? Yes, of course they do. Um, it's a good question. It's in fact a question I usually ask the students uh, when I give these lectures. Uh, for a neutron, for example, it's a neutral particle. The antiparticle is the antineutron. And, and of course, it has the same charge of zero, but actually the way to think about that is to think what, of what is inside the neutron. A neutron, a proton, is made up of quarks, and quarks have charge. So an antineutron is made up of anti-U, an anti-D, and an anti-D quark, whereas a neutron is a U, a D, and a D. And a U quark and a D quark have charge, so then the anti-U and the anti-D quarks have the opposite charge. That works for all composite particles, but there's one category there are two categories of neutral particles that are particularly interesting. One of them is neutrinos, where there are neutrinos and antineutrinos, and those are elementary particles. There's nothing inside the neutrino or the antineutrino. So there you have to think of charge in a more generalized fashion. We think of charge as what couples a particle to the electromagnetic interaction. An electron has a negative charge, one. A proton has a positive charge of one. But that's only the coupling to the electromagnetic interaction. But there are two other interactions. There's a strong interaction and the weak interaction that also have coupling constants. Uh, the strong interaction has a coupling constant related to the color uh, or, or the abstract concept of color uh, of the quarks. The carrier of that force is gluons, and gluons see color charge. And that color charge is also a charge, just like an electromagnetic charge is. But the weak interaction, it's the weak charge. It's the coupling to the W and the Z boson that plays a role. And there's a difference between the coupling to the positive W and the negative W. The, the coupling particles now have the charge. And so depending on whether you couple to the W plus or the W minus, your charge of the neutrino is going to be different than that of the antineutrino. So the answer there is that if we generalize charge to mean not only electromagnetic charge, but also strong interaction, color charge, and the weak charge, then the antineutrino will have the opposite charge on all of these. Of course, the electromagnetic charge is zero. That doesn't change. It doesn't interact strongly. So that is also zero, but the weak charge is opposite. The last particle is the photon. The photon has no charge. It doesn't have a weak charge, it doesn't have a strong charge, it doesn't have an electromagnetic charge. And so, in fact, the photon is its own antiparticle. The photon and the antiphoton are absolutely identical and indistinguishable, which is why when you annihilate an electron and an anti-electron, you can get two photons coming out. Photon and antiphoton, or antiphoton and photon, but they're the same thing. Right. That was really helpful, sir. Thank you. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, on the behalf of the Secrets of Universe and uh, Gurukul Academy, I once again extend our very hearty gra uh, gratitude to you, Professor, for accepting the, our invitation and sharing with us uh, your valuable thoughts. Your thoughts have really enlightened our minds and uh, have shown us a new path. And I would also like to thank all of you for joining us from different parts of the world. And it is your love and support that uh, helps up uh, helps us keep uh, growing and inspire us to continue our work stay tuned to our channel for many such talk on the coming saturdays and thank you once again sir there were really more questions uh, but uh, due to this uh, shortage of time we won't be able to take that so i'll be mailing you all the other questions thank you so 